This is the Dreadful Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're here with part six of our Penny Dreadful coverage. We're covering season three, episodes one to three. Welcome back, fellow Penny Faithful, to Penny Dreadful, Season 3, Episode 1, The Day Tennyson Died. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow Darklings. Welcome to the House of Pain. Yes, the Dreadful Podcast. I am one of your other hosts, John. <laughs> Just the two of us here this time for our coverage of Season 3 of Penny Dreadful. Um, will we start this off with uh, talking about the elephant in the room? I know there's no elephants in this particular episode. Well, yes, that Ray has uh, left us for the time being, uh, and it isn't because it's season three. Nope. It's just because he has a very, very busy March. He certainly does. He certainly does. So he won't be here for much, I think, or if any, of season three of Penny Dreadful. We hope to get him back uh, for our discussions about Penny Dreadful City of Angels as well. Yes, absolutely. That's he has point. gone sailing off to the Arctic, along with old John Clare, the creature. <laughs> um, but he will be back. He will be back yes, for so. City of Angels and hopefully maybe for the last part of uh, this season, season three of Penny Dreadful, which is, as you described, the actual elephant in the room yes yes it is or the yeah. elephant man in the room dare I say it. <laughs> there you go yeah getting on to season three itself i have got that much memory of season three i remember watching it remember getting to the end of the series and going that was okay um it wasn't as good as season one or season two but it's been a long time since i've seen season three and yeah. everything i think i remember so far comes up in the first three or four episodes of this show so i don't know how much memory i have of the end of the season but i know among Penny Dreadful fandom, this one is much maligned, let's say. Um, a lot of people unhappy with how the show ended. A lot of people unhappy that the show ended at all, because a lot of people are very unhappy when a show only goes three seasons, especially when it's only 28 episodes over three seasons, which well, is very true. short. Um, a lot of very beloved characters in here who get their ending at the end of season three, and we never hear anything further about them. So, um, so overall, John, what's your memory of season three? No character stuff, but generally... A bit like you, um, my memory is a little sketchy on season three. Um, I still watched it all, and mm -hmm. I certainly have come into this rewatch with a bit more trepidation because I just didn't know how to, um, how to really kind of, I, I didn't have any preconception really coming into it other than certain aspects of it. Um, you know, I mean, overall, this is much more disparate than the previous two. You know, you've, in seasons one and two, you have the company of Malcolm, Vanessa, Ethan, Victor, uh, and Sembene mm -hmm. uh, working together, you know, and, and with Mr. Lyle coming in, certainly in season two. And um, that core nucleus has been effectively exploded uh, around the Northern Hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, as we saw right at the end of season two with the the creature going to the arctic we had some alchem going to to africa with the the body of some benny mm -hmm. and you had ethan being carted off uh, under lock and key to north america mm -hmm. with inspector rusk so the company is no more and it's not only that the company's exploded but we go to different parts of the world, very much focusing after London onto the US. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it does definitely change the feel of, of the series compared to the other two. Yeah. And you, you know, you do get a lot of, um, new characters coming into this season as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think some of which I'm really excited about, um, after seeing the first three for sure. Um, I, I think one of the things is, is that it's whether they play out in the way that you want them to within the season. I think mm -hmm. that's one of the other things I remember. You know, the great thing about the witches from season two was that with Madame Carly, we saw her in season one at the seance and in the final episode. Mm -hmm. And so 
whilst they were a full part of season two, they were introduced in season one. They they felt familiar yeah. in that sense. So yes, I mean, ultimately, I, I think I've come into this uh, season, season three, with a bit more trepidation. Right. But I am still looking forward to it because I think, um, certainly from the first three episodes, you know, the quality of the production, the cast, and the writing is very much still there. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and speaking of which, the, the show is still show run by John Logan, and he has maintained ever since the show finished, because he gets asked about it very often, he's always maintained that his plan was doing three seasons, that he would, he had written it as a three season arc. That's why things like Ethan coming from America and always going to be dragged back to America was laid in in episode one of season one was that he was planning that at some point, Ethan would go on his journey and we'd find out about his family and we'd find out about his history, uh, that they would separate the company at some point uh, throughout this show. Now, you know, well, let's just see, I suppose, how successful it is and, and, and how we review it, I suppose, that, that how we rewatch the series and let's see what our thoughts are at the end of the series. But so far, first couple of episodes, really enjoying it. Uh, as you know, if you've been following along with us on the Dreadful Podcast, we do cover each episode individually. We try not to spoil anything on the next episodes in case you want to watch one episode and hear each individual ones. But it does depend on how you're getting these episodes because on our main feed on TV Podcast Industries, we've been releasing them with Roughly three episodes for each season, maybe two two episodes for the first season, I think it was, three episodes for the second season, and these three episodes for the third season, uh, covering all of the episodes together, yeah. I suppose. Uh, the original intention was that we were going to cover season one in one episode, season two in an episode, and season three in an episode, but we talk a lot, as you probably know. <laughs> <laughs> and we've ended up being able to put out half an hour to 40-minute episodes about each discussion of each episode of Penny Dreadful. So hopefully you're enjoying this rewatch before we kick into Penny Dreadful City of Angels. Really looking forward to seeing what happens on that show, because it's, it is completely different. They call it a spiritual successor, and... John Logan has been very clear about the fact that he's done with Victorian monsters. He's done with uh, literary creatures or liter literary characters in his television shows. So we're not going to see that side of things. What we will see is the spiritual and the demonic side of things when we get around to City of Angels. So very little information out there so far. But by the time we finish doing these podcasts leading up to the show, I'm sure there'll be loads more information out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that is the best thing that you can hear is that it is a spiritual successor of the first three seasons mm -hmm. of Penny Dreadful, given there is so much spirituality, supernaturalness, mm -hmm. uh, and everything else. Um, Supernaturality? Uh, maybe. I'd, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that. I just, but you know, it's nice that he is still, um, maintaining that, that spiritual connection, even though the characters, the setting, uh, is all changing. Um, you know, I, I am hoping that he really pulls from the Native American uh, and the Mexican or the Aztec law, you know, all these things that surround, um, a lot of what has been, um, sort of amalgamated into Certainly the, you know, the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. uh, within Latin America, uh, and, and within that southwest part of America, which was under Spanish rule. Um, there are many Mexicans there that have brought that culture and, and those stories and tales and traditions. So I, I think this sounds really interesting. It, it's something that I, find fascinating as well. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I think just coming back to season three then, one of the things that I, I couldn't quite fully remember was just that, you know, they do dabble, they do dip into that Native American spirituality mm -hmm. and traditions through Ethan and one of his other fathers, shall we say. Yes. Um so yeah, really um Looking forward to getting into episode one of season three, The Day Tennyson Died. Absolutely. Two quick things before we go into that. Just make sure you subscribe to the podcast on tvpodcastindustries.com. We do have a feed there for all of the podcasts that we do. Everything that we do goes in there. If you want just the podcast about Penny Dreadful, those are available on dreadfulpodcast.com, its own feed, which just has all of our coverage of Penny Dreadful. And finally, these podcasts wouldn't be possible without our supporters over on Patreon. If you want to support us, you can go over to patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. We've been releasing all of our rewatch episodes of Penny Dreadful over there first, so you get access to those before anybody else if you support us over on patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. Yes, absolutely. So please um, spread the love 
love by spreading the podcast through however you want to support mm. us, whether it is subscribing to the podcast over on tvpodcastindustries.com, on any good or evil podcast catcher, such as Google Play, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, you name it, you mm-hmm. can uh, listen to our spooky tones uh, <laughs> on anything to do with Penny Dreadful. Yeah. And if you are listening to us on any of those podcast catchers that have the ability to leave a review or a rating, please do so. Um, Penny Dreadful has been off air for about five or six years. So putting out a podcast during a time when uh, the, the show has been off air for a long time means that nobody's actually putting up reviews for our podcast at the moment. It'd be really cool uh, when we get into the lead into uh, Penny Dreadful Season 4 or Penny Dreadful City of Angels, as it is properly called, uh, that we had a few reviews up there. That'd be kind of cool. If you could do that, that would be so helpful to us. Yes, thank you, fellow Darklings. Absolutely. Let's get into Season 3, Episode 1, The Day Tennyson Died. This episode was again written by John Logan and directed by Damon Thomas. This is the third of six episodes of Penny Dreadful that Damon Thomas has directed. So another old hand uh, coming back for another new episode of the show. Excellent stuff. (laughs) Excellent. John, do you want to give us the summary from IMDb for this episode? Sure. Ethan is a prisoner under Inspector Rusk's watch, heading through America. So Malcolm meets a mysterious Native American while in Africa. Frankenstein gets a visit from an old friend, Dr. Jekyll. Meanwhile in London, the bells across the city ring out following the death of famed poet Alfred Lord Tennyson. As Vanessa goes deeper into depression, Mr. Lau recommends that Vanessa gets help from a very intriguing alienist, Dr. Seward, if... She'll be accepted for therapy. She is a very intriguing alienist or therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist, I guess. Um, Alienist was an old term that kind of encompassed all of those things. But the character of Dr. Seward is very intriguing for multiple reasons, really. Yes. Firstly, a very familiar face. Yes, a very familiar face. Who is related to the other very familiar face from season two yes we'll definitely be getting into that john do you want to give us your big moment from season three episode one yes uh i've i've got the quotes the old work oh yes as dr henry jekyll visits victor frankenstein Mm -hmm. Uh, for me um this is great to have this character in the show and i love how john logan has incorporated dr henry jekyll with dr victor frankenstein uh who are reminiscing about their old work. You know, these two come together very much as outsiders that really have something to prove to the medical establishment, Mm. um, and they want to get to the old work. So there is this suggestion that they know, Dan, which kind of maybe controversial lines of science and investigation they have both gone oh, definitely. Um, and I, I thought this was really good I, I think again another great literary character from uh, the Victorian period coming from the book The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson and mm-hmm. um, you know and again really good you know th- this is a book that actually you know it comes into uh, common parlance in terms of that well-known phrase Jekyll and Hyde mm-hmm. you know this idea of duality of personality and um, that can exist and we get a lot of that here you know you think of Ethan being a, a werewolf and then this very suave hustler cowboy ex-army and mm-hmm. um, you have Sir Malcolm being the the Lord, you know, the the knighted explorer, uh, but at the same time, in the evening, is uh, hunting down supernatural terrors and, and monsters. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of duality here. Yeah, uh, and it, for every character in Penny Dreadful being a major manipulation of good and evil together in in their characters. Yeah. Exactly, and it, the the book looks at that duality of of personality, good and evil. Can they coexist together? Um, within a single person that someone can be both good and evil, uh, have their, you know, light and dark sides, or are the light and dark sides forever to be dominant and, and be the only thing mm. here? Um, and, and that they are actually separated. They become separated. And this is a conversation that, um, Henry Jekyll has with Victor yeah. Frankenstein. 
it, it, it's really, really useful. I think it also applies more generally to the public and private faces of people, what they show to the, the public, say like Dorian Gray, mm -hmm. and actually then how he is in private and certainly very privately with respect to the portrait yeah. uh, in his little hidey hole. Um, <laughs> but I, I love that both men are catching up on their work and their visions to effectively prove this established scientific order wrong, you know, and, they all come, it comes to this crucible, uh, this pact that they have around Lily in the sense that Victor openly tells Henry Jekyll that he has succeeded. He has created life. He has reanimated the biological body. Mm -hmm. But you really get the sense from Victor and, and Dr. Jekyll really understands Victor. You see this. You can see that they obviously grew up in boarding school together, went to university together, had this kind of outsider relationship that he sees the romantic Victor. He knows that Victor is as much uh, embedded within the, the romantic poets of the day as he is with his very hard uh, and objective science. You know, he very much amalgamates these two together mm -hmm. here. Uh, but they come together with this pact to either change Lily using um, Dr. Jekyll's uh, root of controversial science uh, and medicine and that he can change people's behavior yeah. or that they will ultimately destroy her. Um, and you, you get Dr. Jekyll saying, Victor, you don't want to kill her. You want to love her. Mm -hmm. uh, but the love has been rejected. Yeah. And uh, he realizes what he has created. And there is that nice moment where he um, is kind of spying up. Well, it's not a nice moment, I suppose, in that <laughs> sense. But he, you know, he's infatuated with her. He, he's spying on her at Dorian Gray's London residence. And, and she comes out and she's very, I mean, in a sense, she feels sorry for him um, and tells him just to, to go away and don't come here again. You shouldn't be here. And, you know, she has um, she has made that break from her creator yeah. uh, and doesn't particularly want to have anything to do with him. So I, I really uh, like the fact that these two are coming together effectively to fight Lily, but to try and change her initially and if not to destroy her. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting moment for, for these two. And obviously, uh, knowing this as the audience, you're kind of thinking, okay, how will Lily react to this? You know, is she in danger mm -hmm. or, or not? Or is she growing ever more powerful? Well, absolutely. You know, the, the whole idea of it really from Victor is that he wants to put the shackles back on Lily and turn her back into something that she's grown beyond. As we saw at the end of season two, she is now her own person and has now moved on with life completely differently to the character that Victor fell in love with. But all he wants to do is effectively trap her inside a relationship with him. And if he can use the skills of uh, Dr. Jekyll, he's going to do it, you know. Um, I really like the idea because, it, as you mentioned, it, it sounds like they went to school together. So you, you get this idea that the two of them would have been working in science labs till two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, exactly. You know, trading ideas with each other as to how to uh, control um the human psyche in, in Jekyll's case, how you would uh, calm down someone that's, that's, uh, at the anger is overtaking them. And then you'd have, um, Victor Frankenstein sharing the concept that he wants to break the veil between life and death and wants to keep people alive and resurrect people. Uh, and then they come back together here and they're both have had major breakthroughs in their own scientific research. Uh, I just love the idea that these two uh, could have been talking about this at night when they were 15, 16 years old, going through their going through their education studies, and now they're coming back together to use each other's friendship to get what they want. Yeah, and they've not forgotten any of it. You know, Victor calls out um, Jekyll with you know the anger and rage that was within within inside you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and he. he Dr. Jekyll says, I've learned to control it, uh, tame the beast within. Again, coming to that duality element, mm -hmm. um, you know, controlling uh, the chemical impulses of the brain. Um, but I think, you, yeah, you get this sense of them being very competitive towards one another, but because they're both outsiders, partly with Dr. Jekyll, because he's Indian uh, within... An, an Indian in London, in, in white dominated London. Mm. And, and Victor is this socially awkward person. But just, you know, despite this, um, being away from one another, you know, 
Dr. Jekyll, Henry Jekyll sees that Victor is spiraling. You know, he's asking for his help. Even Henry Jekyll is, you know, love, work and narcotics were to begin Victor because he sees the puncture marks on, on Victor's arms. So I think initially this is such a great meeting of two characters, but ones that have a history that John Logan has brought here. Um, Dr. Jekyll is played by Shazad Latif, mm -hmm. who has a Star Trek connection. He played Ash Tyler on Star Trek Discovery, um, who basically also had a lot of issues about uh, identity and duality in that character. Uh, yes. Um, I won't do any spoilers, but certainly, uh, yes, there was uh, two sides to uh, his character, uh, the Yanis of um, Star Trek Discovery, shall mm. we say. Interesting. Um, <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't cover Star Trek Discovery, so we're not going to spoil it on the podcast, but definitely go check it out. It's an excellent uh, couple of seasons of that show so far. Really looking forward to seeing more of it. And Shazad Latif is fantastic in that show. He's really, really good yeah. uh, in the role that he has in there. And really good here. You know, he does play that that uh, character on the brink of losing his his uh, his temper quite often. You know, as you may know, we also did a Marvel podcast. There's also a major connection here with the creation of the character of the Incredible Hulk from Marvel Comics. You know, that's exactly how that character is played all the time as he's on the edge of losing control and letting his version of Hyde take him over as well. So, so it's something we've seen for many, many years in various versions of pop culture and TV and books, but this is the original and I'm, I, I'm intrigued to see how he's being used in this show. You know, the original version of Frankenstein did have him working with other uh, medical professionals and other scientists as well to try and perfect his version yep. of Frankenstein. So the idea that you take another literary character and have him working together on this problem that Victor Frankenstein has just makes a lot of sense. It's kind of cool to have to have them connected this way. Absolutely. And also, I'm slightly stealing from episode two here of this season, but I like how John Logan sort of layers in the contextual Victorian London element here. So Dr. Jekyll is working at Bedlam, which is the great Victorian psychiatric asylum and laboratory mm. um, that we've seen in, in plenty. Again, another term that has come into parlance um, mm -hmm. and, uh, is, is, you know, is famous, uh, in many different horror areas because of this idea of, um, the, the asylum, you know, and, and people, uh, effectively not being themselves, Absolutely. um, because of, of the, the misfiring of synapses and so on. Uh, but most, m most notably, uh, with Boris Karloff from the 1946 film Bedlam. There you go. And Bedlam is a corruption of Bethlehem, which is itself a corruption of Bethlehem. Right. So there's corruption after corruption <laughs> after corruption of yes. where he works with corrupted minds, effectively, yeah. in that sense. I mean, that's maybe slightly unfair on the poor uh, inmates at the asylum, mm -hmm. but you know it, it's but that the idea. Concept of the people in Victorian era would have thought that exactly. Yeah, it, uh, it's that idea that the brain has been corrupted like a computer. You know, there's something not working correctly, and there is this outward, um, you know, very very much again, Doctor Jekyll working with what the society considers to be misfits mm -hmm. at, at the time of varying degrees of severity in the same way that Victor being the um the the butcher that that prepares the cadavers for medical school working in that very sort of lonesome socially um awkward and outside of the normal day to day mm -hmm. so these two are like peas in a pod in absolutely. that sense absolutely uh, one of the corruption of Bethlehem is uh, said to be one of the inspirations uh, for Arkham Asylum from Batman as well so uh, the place where all of the inmates are housed in in uh the city of gotham and batman is supposed to be based on Beth bethlehem as well so um, yeah exactly yeah. like the world is going to bedlam at the moment <laughs> it may not be when this episode it comes might out, not be as i like to uh, to point out john do you have anything left on your point about dr henry jekyll no i i think just you know i really uh enjoy this character mm -hmm. i love that he's been paired with victor frankenstein here the two of them get peppered through these first three episodes and i just wanted to bring it in here on episode one because yeah. um 
Jekyll and Hyde is one of my favourite books mm-hmm. of, of this period. That's yeah, very cool. Very cool. Uh, my major moment from the episode that I wanted to talk about really is the meeting of Vanessa Ives and Dr. Seward. Um, just the starting of the season, effectively, as you mentioned earlier on, John, uh, Sir Malcolm has gone taking the body of Sir Bene away and leaving Vanessa in his home in the Murray household uh, back in London. Um, seeing her broken in the house effectively just destroyed um, while she's left alone. She's not able to get herself out of bed. She's having parcels of food being delivered to the house and you see how ravenously she's eating them when she when she's given the milk, I think, uh, is yeah. what she takes first and just pours it all down her throat because she probably hasn't eaten in days. Uh, and it's Mr. Lyle that comes back to help her out and sends her to this therapist, someone that helped him out and helped him accept himself is the only kind of description we get as to what he went through what Mr. Lyle went through, but he says that she's massively successful in what she has done for him. And hopefully she'll be able to help Vanessa out, even though he knows that it's going to be talking about supernatural things, things that most people wouldn't possibly believe. Remember, Vanessa has already been committed once for talking about the fact that she yes. had supernatural experiences. So the idea that she would go and see a therapist at all is probably terrifying to her. What if she never comes out of that that room again you know what if she's going to be sent off to another um another asylum because of talking to somebody about the things that are going on in our mind so i love how we have the introduction of this character of dr seward when vanessa comes into her because vanessa is so standoffish with her yeah. and she's also poking her with a stick to see if she can push her very far before she tells her anything about uh, what's been going on in the past, you know, um, she says to her, that I can't tell you these things or else you'll, you'll wake up screaming at night, uh, just by hearing the things that I've gone through kind of thing. So, uh, a very familiar face, as we mentioned uh, at the intro to this episode, Patty Lapone, one of our favorite yeah. character actors, uh, in this show. Anyway, the, the character that she played of John Clayton was a massive standout for the one episode that she had. So having her back here and having Vanessa instantly recognize her, you know, it's one of those ones where you go, I'm sure that we had John Logan looking at her performance and going, she's coming back. We're definitely getting her back. I don't care how we're going to do it. We'll have to write it in there somehow. But addressing it, at least in the opening moments where Vanessa's kind of going instantly has a little bit of trust for her because Joan Clayton was somebody that was that she had a lot of love for by the end, um, but yeah. knows that she was harsh but fair with her. Um, and then kind of calls out the name Joan Clayton to Dr. Seward, who instantly goes, I, how could I possibly know that person? How could I possibly have spent any time with her? She's a, a, a distant ancestor. So hundreds of years before Dr. Seward had arrived in the UK and arrived in, in England this person existed. So she says they are our great ancestors from up north, effectively. So, uh, so it's, it's another kind of tying on the fact that Joan Clayton is centuries old or was centuries old yeah. when she, when she eventually died. But the idea that Vanessa couldn't possibly know anything about her. So that's intriguing to Dr. Seward. So again, I, I just like the kind of game the two of them are playing with each other. Oh, definitely. Um, Dr. Seward not giving anything. I love her, her mention to her. I'm not your husband. I'm not your doctor, but you are here to get well. If you agree with that, if you're here to come to me and tell me your problems, I will make you well. That's my, that's my role here. So you have to meet me halfway with that you know i kind of i kind of like their idea with yeah that. it you know she says she's a new field of, of medical science mm-hmm. it, it seems to be yeah that that one of psychiatry that um is a conversation between um the doctor and the patient mm-hmm. it is not like the banning clinic where she was tied up um and held yes where you're being forced with particular procedures and the conversation is very much from the doctor to the patient mm-hmm. but that's why it, as you say it's so good that there is this antagonism that vanessa immediately puts on dr seawood yet she sees a familiar face looking back at her and in the same way dr seawood is as equally antagonistic uh, of her as was joan clayson you know there is an efficiency of the use of words that is both abrupt and seemingly loveless between mm-hmm. uh, from Dr. Seward to Vanessa mm-hmm. um, and vice versa. And I like them bouncing off one another here. I mean, it almost seems that Dr. Seward doesn't want Vanessa to be her patient. She goes, it's 10 shillings per session. If you don't like it, it's the price of a good dentist. Go and get your teeth seen <laughs> to. Um, whereas Vanessa's kind of, she doesn't quite believe that this doctor doesn't want her to be her patient mm-hmm. and that she will be just seen as 
a a prized patient that she can use to make her yeah. maybe more famous, improve her standing within uh, the profession. So and what's the phrase she uses? It's uh, you're, you need to collect and cure me as as the yeah. phrase. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's really really kind of nicely done mm-hmm. uh, between these two. Um, and and then once again, you know, I love the reaction from Vanessa when she sees this face of someone that she thought dead. You know, that's exactly what is going through her mind because. While she looks much better kept and has a better haircut, um, a little severe, but uh, much better haircut yeah. than John Clayton, it looks instantly to Vanessa's eyes as if someone has been reincarnated in front of her. And, uh, you know, she's gone through a whole experience of the witches of the, of the nightcomers. So the reaction of her kind of going, uh oh, what have I just walked into here? You know, uh, we also meet up with Renfield, a very, very creepy receptionist, uh, the receptionist for Dr. Stewart. <laughs> he is so creepy, even from the opening moments. And he's not really supposed to be, I don't think. Uh, not from at that, this moment. From that no. introduction, he's not supposed to be creepy, but there's just something that, that kind of makes your skin crawl a little bit with him. Um, he's just a little bit creepy uh, when, when we see him at first, but we, End the episode and just where we're, where I want to close out, I suppose, the point of what's happening with Vanessa. She does seem to get a little bit of help from, from Dr. Seward. She's told to go out and do something to make herself happy. And she pays a visit to the National History Museum with a little bit of prompting, prompting from the, uh, graying looking uh, child who's selling newspapers on the street uh, as he's telling her that uh, yes. Tennyson's died maybe you should take a visit in here uh, to the uh, to the Natural History Museum it's a bit, uh, bit of a creepy little moment yeah Dr. Seawood uh, basically tells her to go break the cycle go and do something that you Different. wouldn't normally do yeah. um, and, and in going to the Natural History Museum um, she's looking at all the exotic creatures that have been effectively killed stuffed mm-hmm. and put on display Magic. but we know um, from season one that that's something that she would have done herself so it's it's something that would interest her right yeah exactly she, was, she did uh, taxidermy uh, yes with her friends very weird pastime and this is where she meets dr alexander sweet the head zoologist the director of uh, the exhibit mm-hmm. and, and so on here um and yes th- th- this is kind of you know it's that it, they kind of meet over taxidermy. We remember Vanessa uh, in her recollections from season one, where she is doing taxidermy with Mina and Peter, um, and they kind of connect over the taxidermy, the stuffed animals, um, and and we have Alexander Sweet seemingly a bit on the same wavelength as Vanessa. You know, he goes, "I care for the unloved creatures. Uh, those dusty cases. Make sure you go to to see them, mm-hmm. uh, because if if I don't, who who will?" They meet initially over the scorpion displays as well. Oh, of course. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of symbolism here uh, of these two characters. Um, which we'll be getting to when we discuss episode two. Definitely, definitely. Not going to spoil it all here. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> but that was my main my main point, just the introduction of Dr. Seward and this uh, this return of Patty Lapone uh, to the show. So I'm delighted to have her back. And I think their relationship here is quite intriguing. A- any notes for the first episode that you want to talk about without spoiling anything from the second episode, John? The the, the main notes, Dr. Seward and Renfield are both from Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mm-hmm. Um, Renfield actually being the original... Um, lawyer that goes out to, um, Transylvania to Dracula's, uh, castle to, to, to start the, the process of Dracula buying up the properties around London for him to move to. That's right. Before Mr. Harker. Yes. Who was Mina's supposed hus- husband. Yeah. The fiance. Yes. Yeah. In Dracula. And then, yes, that's right. Okay. So, yes. So that's a nice little tie in mm-hmm. here. And then Dr. Seawood. And um, it was the character was John Seawood in Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, where he is what connected to the Harker family mm-hmm. and Mina uh, and is is there to um it is one of the first doctors to come into contact with the, the vampiric state yes. that they're that some of the characters enter into after a good old uh, nosh around nosh the neck. On the neck. Uh, yes, yes so, exactly. So yes, so Paddy Lapone also playing a character from Dracula. Very cool. We will talk about the other two storylines that happen in this episode, the stuff with Ethan and Hecate and the stuff with Malcolm Murray and uh, his new partner. Uh, we'll talk about those in the next episode because I think they're kind of alluded to a bit uh, in this episode, but we don't see 
enough of them to really talk about them as major points. Uh, and there's only two of us, so we'll talk about them a bit more in the second episode, I think. Yeah, exactly. I think the only other big thing from this episode that we have to really mention, and it, it involves Renfield, um, is, you know, he closes up the office of Dr. Seward. He, he goes looking for, um, I suppose, some Friday night fling uh, in with mm. a prostitute. But that all comes to a very, very abrupt end as the prostitute gets slammed against mm-hmm. the wall. I mean, literally smashed. It's, it really does feel violent. Yeah. Um, and she looks completely broken. As yeah, well. exactly. And you say prostitute, but she's a woman selling stuff on the side of the street. And this creepy character of Renfield is just kind of throwing money at her going, do you want to have a quickie at the back? She's not really a prostitute. She's, he's just paying her money to have sex with her. It's kind of the, the creepy part about Renfield. You, you got an image of, of him that he's going, you know, counter to counter down the street going to any woman that will look at him would you would you have sex with me for a little bit of cash yeah like, that's well exactly uh, but he gets whisked into the darkness mm-hmm. and, and we come to a, a new i suppose nest of vampires or at least th- their familiars uh with uh this this sort of defunct looking warehouse mm-hmm. um as great sound effect um really as then their master arrives mm-hmm. um and he effectively um lets it be known that he is dracula yes. uh, and he does enroll renfield into uh, his move towards Vanessa, mm-hmm. that he says, "You will learn more and inform me. You will open her secrets uh, to me." And he he finishes it off with, "Give me your neck. Give me your throat. Give me your blood." Um, you know, I am the master. Um, I am Dracula. This is very much. Um, it feels to me this idea of a reflection of season two mm-hmm. where. We, we found out about the two brothers cast out of heaven. Um, season two was Lucifer primarily with the witches. And now we are meeting Dracula for the first time. In a sense, the, the vampire, the head vampire who had Mina, or at least was there at the Grand Guignol at the end of season one, mm-hmm. that was not the, the master. That Absolutely. was just the, the master for that nest at the Grand Guignol. Yeah, it's a nice reminder, isn't it? Because, you know, it was mentioned back in season one that that was never the end of the story. That was always a sub level master, I suppose. They hadn't reached the top level. All they were trying to do was get Mina back, basically. But there was one other person that was actually chasing after Vanessa. So nice that at the start of this season, we get that. One last thing, because we didn't mention him, uh, John Clare's trip to the Arctic as well. Because uh, kind of have to mention another really horrific moment in the episode where we have um, <laughs> yeah. all of the, the crew members who are dying effectively they're running out of food they're, they're there's everybody's dying of frostbite and uh, and everybody's uh, either sick or dying and you have some proposing that they actually eat some of the frozen men that were on board the ship um john claire for a moment protects a young boy who's coughing um but then realizes he only has a few days to live and snaps his neck and walks away yes um he has a vision of his own family for the first time john claire does so he has a vision of his past and his history so he knows he's about to leave but realizes that the boy couldn't possibly survive so yeah. he kills the boy in a way in a john claire type of way or the creature type of way he's doing something nice for the boy because he doesn't want him to die painfully over the three days but it's pretty brutal though well, let's just say, I think so far in TV uh, history that I do think John Clare, or the creature, as we would like to affectionately call him, mm-hmm. um, he does snap necks really quite well. It's pretty incredible. You, you, you that, get yeah. the sense that he does <laughs> it pretty well. But I like the fact that you're right. It comes from a sense of pushing the, the child out of, of its misery. And that's because... We see a flashback, but it's not a flashback. It's a remembrance. It's a memory um, of his old life mm-hmm. uh, with a very sick child. Um, and th- this is an interesting part here because I, I'm trying to think whether it is the first time. I think it really is, it is that definitely. we see John Clare remembering his past, which is very exciting, um, I think. I think the other great thing here is that just seeing the contrast with the the, the sailors 
in the you know with his hands being as cold as marble he can he's he's quite enjoying this cold it doesn't phase him you know i'm surprised he didn't bring his sort of you know sunbathing towel to to lie out and (laughs) and soak up the coldness um he seemed to be enjoying himself quite a lot yeah Uh, i just want to point out fellow uh petty faithful the reason why john said the words that was very exciting in the way he did was because he was reading while he said that but he is quite excited about it yeah (laughs) no i know i am i am um but the one thing i really like to think about with regards to this ship is i like to think of of it as being the HMS Terror, mm. uh, the sh- because he was going to the Arctic. That this was HMS Terror, and it was accompanied with another ship that they were trying to force the Northwest Passage mm-hmm. in winter, and they both got caught in the in the ice as it, it went deep into winter, and all hands were lost at sea. The, this idea that this would be HMS Terror, mm. um, which was also a TV show, it was. Um, just it, it just fits it perfectly. Yeah. So whether it is or it isn't, for me, he is aboard HMS Terror. <laughs> I don't see any other ship it could be well, for Penny Dreadful. Can I give you one? Uh, because the Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the one that starred Robert De Niro, the opening of that movie was a ship run aground in the Arctic. Yes. Uh, and we had Victor Frankenstein in the Arctic with his version of the creature as well. So I think it's a little nod back to that movie of I, there. I think but I think is. both of them may be HMS Terror. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be. I do like the sound of that for yeah, sure. There you um go. whether it is or it isn't. <laughs> That's it. That's our discussion about season three, episode one of Penny Dreadful, the day Tennyson died. And we didn't even talk about Tennyson in it. Well, that's true. I don't really, I'm not great with poetry now or with poets full <laughs> you stop. You actually just hate poetry. Um, because like we didn't even get the reference about John Clare being a, an English poet and that mm-hmm. that was what the creature had picked. The only thing I know literally about, um, Tennyson is that A, he was a poet, uh, and B, I do know one of the lines uh, and it is given to us here. Uh, by Mr. Lyle, that it is better to have loved and lost mm-hmm. than never to have loved at all. Yes. Uh, which is an awesome line, it for is. sure. It is, certainly, and a, and a big reference to Vanessa Ives and Ethan Chandler, of exactly. course. Exactly. Um, so, yes, good old Tennyson for providing us with that line. We'll take a break, and we'll be back with our discussion about Season 3, Episode 2, Predators Far and Near. Hi, I'm one of the High Priests of Conchu Ray, and I have the sacred privilege of providing you, the loony listener, with a podcast honouring Marvel's very own Moon Knight. So join me and a host of others at Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, or support the show by becoming a Patreon member. Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. It's time to get your Conchu on. Welcome back, fellow Penny Faithful. We're talking about Penny Dreadful Season 3, Episode 2, Predators Far and Near. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Not a predator at all. Hello there, fellow Darklings. Yes, I am one of your other hosts, John. Also not a predator. No, I'm being predated upon. (laughs) I'm being hunted by the Master. (laughs) Everyone's being hunted by the Master, it seems, doesn't it? Yes, it it (laughs) certainly does. Does. <laughs> Certainly does indeed. Well, definitely Vanessa. Anyway, we're going to crack on with our discussions about season three, episode two, Predators Far and Near. The episode was directed once again by Damon Thomas and written by John Logan. John, our John, not John Logan, do you want to give us the summary for this episode? Sure. Dorian Gray and Lily rescue a girl named Justine from a torture house, and Lily promises her that she will have revenge against those who hurt her. Sir Malcolm and Kayetane embark on a ship to the American West to rescue Ethan. Meanwhile, Inspector Rusk refuses to hand the matter of Ethan's execution to the Americans due to his snatching, but Ethan transforms and murders his escorts with the help of Hecate. Dr. Jekyll shows Victor Frankenstein his lab, They agree to test on a subject before attempting anything on Lily. Frankenstein has a tender moment with Lily, who advises him not to see her again. Meanwhile, Vanessa begins her regular sessions with Dr. Seward, while her receptionist, Renfield, begins gathering information for his new master. (laughs) 
After the session, Vanessa attends a lecture given by Dr. Sweet and later invites him to accompany her for a night out. Later, Renfield visits his master's lair with the information he has gathered. His master, Dr. Sweet, is revealed to be Dracula. <laughs> Doctor, not so sweet. No, not so sweet at all. <laughs> um, yes, those eyes were great as he looks up to, to slit his wrist to allow Renfield to feed. Mm -hmm. What a great image. Fantastic. I loved yeah. it. Really, really um, cool. Yeah, really nicely done. One um, thing I'm so glad about is that they didn't keep this a secret for very long because you kind of exactly. knew in episode one, didn't you? Yeah, you, de you, know, yeah. <laughs> you knew any chance encounter with someone who was charming um, was not going to be the encounter it looked like yeah. on the face of it. Especially for poor Vanessa. No, exactly. <laughs> it's like it's a, a guarantee that the person's going to be a bad person. <laughs> She's just had a pep talk from Mr. Lyle, mm -hmm. who has given us some sound advice to get her back on her feet. Um, she's, you know, taking those tentative steps. And the first person she runs into is another one of these demons that just want to kind of um, capture her and have her by their side. Mm. Seems like a prophecy or something. It really does. Oh, it was a prophecy. It was, <laughs> yes. Um, she is Amonet who will walk with Amon Ra. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Or will she? Exactly. <laughs> will Dracula be successful where Lucifer wasn't? Exactly. Yeah, interesting stuff. John, do you want to give us your big moment from Season 3, Episode 2? Yes. Um, I've got another quote to start off my point here. Do your people always speak so enigmatically? Mm -hmm. um, this is Sir Malcolm to Kayetane, um, who is played here by Wes Studi, mm -hmm. um, who I loved from Last of the Mohicans. Oh, yes. Um, absolutely loved him from Last of the Mohicans. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, of this actor. Mm -hmm. Just primarily, I think, for, for, for that movie. Um, and, I, I I like these two characters together. Mm -hmm. Um Kayetani is this defiant Native American. Um he, you know, he says, I am Chiricahua Indian by birth and right. Mm -hmm. Um just so strong and um stoic. And we didn't really mention it in episode one, we said we'd talk about it in episode two. Their introduction to the two characters where they meet in Zanzibar is really interesting because we do finally, I think, we actually get a little moment of Timothy Dalton doing his Bond, James Bond moment as he's being attacked from all around. Kat and I taking out some of the folks, but we do have um Sir Malcolm turning on people with a gun that feels very bond like uh, in that in that first moment i think it's because he's alone and he doesn't have the power of ethan on one side and the power of uh, simbene on the other side this time he feels like he's his own powerful bond character even though ketney is a very powerful character it feels like a bond moment for once yeah definitely and i mean kayetney helps him here I, I love the fact that he scalps uh, the last person he takes down um, right in front of Sir Malcolm, mm -hmm. and he just turns and says, "Old traditions die hard." And um, I think as well, just the context of that meeting in Zanzibar, um, where he he says to to Sir Malcolm, "Ethan Chandler needs your help. Come to America," and effectively says, "Our son needs us." Mm -hmm. uh, I love this idea that Sir Malcolm, you know, we, we saw him having fatherly conversations with Victor, but there were a few with, with Ethan, but there was a, an element of distrust between the two of them. Certainly, um, initially, I think that kind of disappeared and yeah. uh, became less so a, as time went on. Kayetne then is also seen as this father figure in some way mm. to, um, to Ethan Chandler as well, or dare I say Ethan Talbot, um, oh. you know, maybe a more supernatural father to um, Ethan. But one of the great things is, you know, Sir Malcolm immediately um, almost fobs him off, but he says, but you were born to fight the demons of the earth and sky. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is one of the things that I, I love um, about these two interacting. They're both stoic figures. They, they, they really are. Yeah. Um, but coming from very different places. I think one of the great things I liked here is when Malcolm stands up for Kaitney on the train as they're traveling across, 
uh, the vast interior of the U.S. to try and track down Ethan. Uh, you know, there are two American redneck cowboys that are effectively throwing uh, racist abuse, saying he shouldn't be in the first class carriage. They should be in with the post and in with the horses uh, on, on in the in the mail cart. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ma- Malcolm stands up to these two um, redneck cowboys. And I, I love the fact that Sir Malcolm really puts the fear of God into these two uh, rednecks to effectively back down. But the uh, Kayetne is just so defiant. And I, I really uh, enjoyed this. I mm-hmm. think um, the other thing that I really like is just this dipping into Native American um, spirituality mm-hmm. uh, and culture. Uh, you know, Kayetney says, our son needs us. Um, you know, and he speaks to Ethan across the spiritual plane uh, using some kind of smoke or psychoactive drug. It's just a, a, a great kind of nod to the um, fantastic traditions of uh, the Native Americans, and I, I think that um, I, th- I think the reason why I'm so I so enjoyed this is because we've had these moments in the previous seasons where Ethan has described what he's done to Native Americans mm-hmm. um, as being being in the U.S. Army and and the great Indian wars that happened in terms of as the, uh, America moved westwards across that vast interior of america well the and, Europeans, and, yeah. yeah yeah and and to finally sort of find out that um he has this father figure in kayakne um seemingly one that is at odds because when he does speak to him at, across that spiritual plane um he really doesn't seem to like Kayetney. There, there is some bad bad blood um, and no love lost between these two there's the great line which suggests the nature of their relationships where he says, look into my eyes. Did they look at you when you killed them? Says Ethan to, um, Kayetne. Mm. Um, and yes, is this the king wolf? Is this the, you know, in the same way as Dracula is the master of vampires? Is this, um, you know, patient zero within mm. the werewolf uh, community? I, I, I like that kind of idea. I like yeah, the idea sure. of a werewolf community. I think that's quite cool. Well, this, yeah. <laughs> werewolf pack, maybe. Yeah, a pack. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. And um, I'm probably thinking of the New Zealand movie uh, with all the werewolves going around. Um, they're werewolves, not swearwolves. Uh, what yeah, we do exactly. In the yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, thinking of yes, a nice community in sort of suburban New Zealand, um, sort of doing their thing. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I really like how it connects in with. Um, effectively, there's really awful tales mm. of uh, a, a America's treatment of the Native Americans. Absolutely. And I wanted to point out one of the things that was in uh, the first episode as well, uh, kind of the voiceover that Sir Malcolm's doing in the first episode. Um, he's talking about the fact that Africa has lost its luster and has lost its romanticism now that it's, it's full of slavers, effectively. So he is completely appalled by the slave trade that's going on in Africa and what it's done to all of the people that are there and all, and everything that's going on there. You know, remember he was an explorer and he would have been somebody that would have been an early, uh, arrival on the, on that continent effectively. It's someone that had, had wished he'd find, fa- he'd found the uh, source of the Nile was, was one of the things he'd always strived for was finding that. And then he comes back to Zanzibar with the body of Sembene and realizes how much the presence of these English explorers has damaged the country of Africa. Yeah. Um, so I kind of like that that set Malcolm up in a new way for this season to, to go and explore the Americas with someone who has also been hurt by the Europeans coming over and destroying America yeah, by taking the exactly. land away from the Native Americans. So it kind of sets Malcolm in a new place by going to visit Zanzibar in himself, I think, which is just a, a nice touch that they did at the beginning of season, of uh, season three. Definitely. And I, I think, um, the, the great thing about the, that communication that Kayetney does is that within, um, the, I suppose the spiritual traditions of Native Americans, uh, you have this animistic, uh, religion and shamanistic religion where, you know, uh, animistic is that, you know, trees the landscape the environment Mm. animals our deities in themselves have this spirituality that they uh, worship that's right and and the shamanistic were you know different states of consciousness are are reached 
Um, so it, it fits in nicely if, if he is the werewolf father to, to Ethan. Yes. Um, as well, this idea of, of coming from this spiritual tradition, uh, which I, I really, I, I find really fascinating, mm-hmm. to be honest. And I love that that's what, um, John Logan is capturing here. Mm-hmm. Even down to the fact where Ethan is in the saloon, I think in Cascabel, mm. um, and he is served by a Native American lady. Um, and he gives her a warning before he turns because it's a full moon. He says, you can leave this room right now. Uh, I'm one of uh, Kayetne's tribe. And, you know, you see the acknowledgement in her face. I, I just thought that was really yeah. uh, a nice little touch uh, within this episode. But um, for me, yeah, I I think this 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 coupling of Sam Alcan with Kayetne it is just so, so good. Mm. Um, and it, it's one of the things I remember really enjoying about season three mm-hmm. is this whole connection between... Uh, Malcolm and Kayetne, this idea of them being fathers to Ethan and exploring, certainly through Kayetne, the influence of Native Americans um, that they still had uh, at the time, but also with Ethan, despite what he's done to them. And like, it's kind of an interesting dynamic uh, for me. I think the interesting thing when I was looking up about um, the Indian spirituality, just given what Ethan talks about as well, taking, you know, children from the tribe mm-hmm. and effectively anglicizing them and Americanizing them. And that Native Americans weren't able to practice their spirituality or their religion. It was still banned up until 1978 in the US. Wow. Which I was like gobsmacked at. Yeah. Um, so it just shows you to what extent... Um, that first people has been suppressed yeah, here. Yeah. Um, and, and so I kind of, I, I root for Kayetne. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great character. Great new, great new addition to the, to the, uh, series. I did think it was interesting having Heck actually paired up with Ethan. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? The coupling between the two of them, especially because she joins him in the attack, becomes the nightcomer, comes out of the wall and kills some people around him. And then she's kind of going, uh, so are we together now? Is that, you know, are we going around, around the, all of America, gonna, and we're going to rule. Is that what's going to happen now with the the <laughs> yeah. wolf of, of the Lord? And you kind of see with him going, like she caused so much trouble for him and yeah. his entire group last season. So would he be willing to work with her? Would he need to work with her? Is there any particular reason that she's giving him other than the fact that she is a very par- powerful witch? It is the start of a really interesting and potentially odd dynamic. Yeah, um, you know, probably a relationship or a a coupling that is forced upon Ethan Mm -hmm. rather than willingly entered into. Uh, But I I thought that was really, uh, yeah, I thought that was an interesting um, thing to bring Hecate back here. But Mm -hmm. it makes sense, as you say, given the whole uh, scene in his room uh, towards the end of season two. Uh, It's a nice little touch as well. Also, just to say to the question, do your people always speak so enigmatically? Mm-hmm. Kayetne does answer yes. yes. yes uh, which is a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice little play uh, on those, I suppose, dare I say it, those Western films where you do have that kind of wise spiritual Native mm-hmm. American. Um, and he's just kind of like, yeah. It's our stick. Exactly. I'm owning it. Shut up. <laughs> I like it. I like yeah. it. Um, my big moment from the episode really is just the reintroduction of Lillian Dorian because uh, we didn't really get anything of them in episode one. And they were two major characters finishing off the season as two supernatural beings and two um, immortal beings now working together. So uh, getting to see their plan in the, to begin with, I suppose, what the beginnings of it and what they're going to do with them in season three, I thought was really interesting. Um, we've seen some brutality in this world, this Victorian world that John Logan created uh, for the first couple of seasons. But I think the opening of this episode probably feels more brutal than anything we've seen before. Yeah. This group of um, of rich old men sitting in a room waiting for a young girl to be beaten to death in front of them. Like, Dare I say it's almost like a precursor to a snuff movie. Yeah, that, that's basically. what it felt like, that um, this was the Victorian equivalent to the snuff movie. Mm. They would kidnap 
someone to kill them, yeah. and they were willing to pay significant money to to watch that. And they're watching um, her be killed. It's not like they're even participating. It seems yeah. they're just watching her be killed. Like it's just, it's really disturbing uh, in in the intention and the minute that Lily and uh, Dorian pull out their guns and kill everybody in the room, you're you're absolutely rooting for them, you know? Uh, this new character of Justine is introduced here uh, being saved by Lily and, and Dorian. I kind of like the tiny twist to uh, villainousness that we have in Lily when she does uh, bring Justine in. There's no comforting whisper from her telling her yep. she's safe. She doesn't say that. She says, you're mine to, yes. uh, to Justine. So, um, interesting. So recruiting from these downtrodden women in, in London is where we start with their, uh, with their new plan, I suppose. So, um, so intrigued to see, uh, what happens with them. I, I love that they, uh, bring her to Dorian's amazing apartment in London, uh, and then treat her really well, bring her to her new home and then tell her if she's willing to join them, they will have a monumental revenge on the men of London. Uh, I think it's a, gr- a great moment. And I, I kind of like having Dorian in this kind of supporting position yeah. to Lily, you know, it's, it's interesting that she would even team up with Dorian considering the feeling she seems to have for any man. Um, but I suppose him being an immortal and him, him being another supernatural being is kind of what gets him a pass in a way. Yeah. He, he's different. Actually, it almost feels like she's treating Dorian in the same way that he has treated other people previously. Mm-hmm. He's connected in with them because they're different. She's doing the same because he's not like normal men. Yeah. But will she get bored of him like he has previously? Which is an interesting question it moving is. forward yeah. in terms of uh, this relationship. And mm-hmm. um, there is just one other moment that, that was in the episode as well that I wanted to talk about. I know we talked about it in, in uh, episode one already with Victor and Lily having their meeting because Victor has been watching Lily uh, from outside of her apartment. But I really like the scene. So I want to talk about it a little bit more here again. Sorry, I know there's loads of other stuff to talk about in the episode. But um, but it, there's a tenderness to Lily with Victor where she's yes. saying to him, I know I was your first love. I get it. I know you were a virgin before we slept together. I understand that. But you'll move on. Everybody has a first love they have to move on from. You can't be sitting outside the house here. And you would expect that Lily would actually kill him. Um, yeah. You know, but she's very tender with him. She's saying, I'm not the person that you fell in love with. If you continue to stalk me, you will see the person I'm becoming and you're not going to like it. It's first love. You will recover from this. And she lets him walk away, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I kind of like that that's the way she's played this with, with Victor because there's so many other ways that she could have done it. So I kind of like that she is willing to tell him and be very realistic with him. Just this is it. It's over. Walk away before it gets any worse. We know from yeah. the rest of the story, it is getting worse. We know Victor's already engaged, uh, Dr. Um, Jekyll to help him to change her personality to, so that she will just fall for him again. But it was a moment where at least she's trying to reason with him without pushing him away or without laughing in his face like she did before. Yes. You know, she's trying to tell him this is over. My, our story is done. Yeah, exactly. And it, it feels like with the pact that he has with Dr. Jekyll, he's trying one last time to see if she will come willingly without requiring Dr. Jekyll's yeah. uh, chemistry and uh, his science mm-hmm. uh, or indeed to destroy her. Yeah. That, you know, this is kind of that one last romantic proposition that he is trying to do to bring her back to him. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Exactly. That was my main point for the episode and your main point for the episode. I know we can't cover everything that goes on in the episode, especially the only two of us, and we're just covering our big moment. But there's so much that went on in this episode that I think needs to be talked about, Just even just to mention it. Um, Dr. Jekyll actually curing this violent queen threatener. I think I've written in my notes here. Uh, He does cure him with just a simple solution. This thing that he's been promising for Victor, uh, that he's able to cure someone of their violent tendencies, gives one injection, and Mr. Balfour turns back into a normal Scottish person basically. Yes. So I find this really intriguing. And the first time I saw it, I think I was saying it to you afterwards, John, when we watched the episode, you see this, this guy coming in with crusty face and his hair all matted. And, um, he looks really like he's been in prison for years for, for this uh, crime that he committed. Well, as of, Victor, as Victor says, never threaten the queen. Exactly. Otherwise you go into the asylum. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the idea that then he gets this injection and he's completely cleaned up as his hair looks like he's, he's just had it done almost. Uh, his face has lost all the crustiness to it and it's, it's a normal face again. 
when I saw it first, I was kind of going, oh, well, they, that wouldn't happen. That's not possible. But it is possible in the world of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, because that's the central premise of them. It's only when I talked to you about it afterwards, John, while we were having that chat, I suddenly realized, but that's the whole premise of yes. the Incredible Hulk and Bruce Banner, the Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is that when they change from one from one uh, being to another being, it's unrecognizable who they were yeah, beforehand, who exactly. they were as Mr. Hyde. It's unrecognizable when they become Dr. Jekyll. So uh, so that is a reference to to the book. But when I saw it on, on screen, I was kind of going, did they get a cleaner in to clean his face in those two seconds that he was <laughs> that he was knocked out kind of thing for Mr. Balfour? But uh, but no, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I, I think. um I think for me, t- two of the things from this is, is definitely that, uh, um, Dr. Jekyll's laboratory in, in Bedlam is just amazing. It's, it's oh, as yeah, good yeah. as Victor's, um, attic reanimation studio. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really nicely done. I, I really like this idea again. You know, he does his thing in here and no one really asks any questions. I think the other interesting thing about Mr. Balfour is that he is, um, a social agitator from Scotland, mm-hmm. um, because Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, was Scottish. Very good. Um, and one of the things in terms of the duality, um, you know, we talked about it personally, about the private public life in the previous episode. Um, but one of the other elements was about the, um, I suppose that iteration at that time, of Scottish independence and Scottish nationalism uh, as opposed to English nationalism. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, it's kind of interesting that, um, that was picked up on in making Mr. Balfour effectively, um, a Scottish, uh, social agitator that was, uh, threatening the Queen. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, again, the difference between monarchy or republicanism, I suppose. But mm-hmm. so that, that was really good. I really liked, um, Renfield here, you know, the morning after the night before, um, where <laughs> he, you know, he, he's looking a little paler, maybe a little creepier, certainly. Mm-hmm. His reactions are better. You can get that fly, That's pluck right. it out of the air to, to have a little manger first thing uh, in the morning. Uh-huh. But the he, blinds are slightly closed as well, you notice this yeah, time. Uh, it's a little Vanessa darker arrives. in the room. Yeah. Um, but he is monitoring uh, Vanessa's therapy, uh, which are on those uh, great uh, gramophone, uh, the wax cylinders, mm-hmm. um, in return for blood uh, from Dracula, that he you know, he brings the information back. Um and uh, I, I did put in my uh, notes that Renfield feeds on sweet, sweet Dr. Sweet blood. <laughs> um, yes. And we get confirmation here right at the end as um, Renfield is feeding from the, the wrist of Dracula. Um, You'll be flesh of my flesh, says Dracula, that... The, the camera pans up really nicely as Dr. Sweet's head is back. His eyes are very red and mm. um, as he is feeding uh, his, his spy effectively Renfield. Yeah. Um, so a great, great ending to, to this episode. Definitely. Definitely. Only other thing to note for me in the episode is how they're keeping uh, Inspector Rusk involved because now he seems to be joining the Pinkertons to go on the search for Ethan. He caught his man once before. Will he catch him again this time? So, uh, so interesting that uh, that Inspector Rusk is going to be uh, following Ethan uh, on his journey across America. Yes, he's enrolled the Federal Marshal this time, mm. um, a Franklin Osto. The actor who plays Franklin Osto um, was in the Channel Four series Shameless, mm-hmm. which was about a council estate in Manchester, <laughs> which was hilarious and yes. has been adapted into the US. Yes, as yes, well. Absolutely. Absolutely. On HBO as well, I think. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's the Northern Irish father. So it's a character we know very well uh, and seeing him putting on yeah, this American accent. Really is very good different. to see him yeah. uh, doing uh, doing that for yeah, sure. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, that's it for my notes for this episode. Anything else you want to talk about before we get on to the next one? No, uh, only to say that I have another great Dr. Sweet joke uh, for the next episode. Oh, great. I like <laughs> thanks so much we'll be back with our next episode of a petty dreadful season three episode three good and evil braided b after this quick break hi this is derek from tv podcast industries we hope you're keeping safe and well at this time and hopefully we're providing a little bit of entertainment to get you through some of the boredom that comes along with uh, what's been going on at the moment 
If you've been enjoying the podcast, we'd love if you subscribe to us at tvpodcastindustries.com or you can support us by going over to patreon.com slash tvpodcastindustries. You can also support us by leaving a review on your podcast catcher of choice or, of course, you can share the podcast with any of your friends because sharing the podcast is sharing the love. Remember, we've covered many, many shows over all the years that we've been podcasting. We've covered things like Gotham, The Boys on Amazon Prime. We've covered Pennyworth, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Agent Carter, Luke Cage, Iron Fist. So if you've enjoyed the coverage that you've been listening to, hopefully you'll check out some of the other shows that we've done. And we've got lots more to come. And thank you, as always, so much for listening. Welcome back to our discussion about Penny Dreadful, Season 3, Episode 3, Good and Evil Braided Bee. Look at you turning into a romantic poet. <laughs> Is that a romantic? I'm not sure whether you want to have good and evil braided together. Do you? Probably not. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I actually did think that this was going to be a quote from another Victorian poet. Mm. Um, maybe so, Tennyson, maybe some Yeah, else. exactly. Uh, but... I didn't find any reference to it right. uh, in my searching. This is from the great poet and writer John Logan. <laughs> it, it could be, but what always happens when a TV show uses a quote from a poem, especially an obscure poem, is all of a sudden it's only the TV show results that come up in Google. <laughs> well, that's true. You, know, you have to really search hard uh, in case uh, in case it might be somewhere underneath uh, somewhere. But we will say that, as always, this episode was written by John Logan, so potentially he came up with the name uh, just completely out of nowhere. It certainly feels like John Logan using his literary uh, genius. Yeah. Either that or it's out of Dante's Inferno, I, I would guess. <laughs> well, maybe. But as I said before, I am no poet. Let's just jump straight into the discussion, John. Uh, the episode was directed by Damon Thomas once again. Three in a row. Yeah, three in a row. Directors 3, Season 3, Episode 3, Good and Evil Braided B. Lots and lots of rhyming, John. <laughs> <I guess. Yes. laughs> Maybe you're the poet. No, I really am not. <laughs> really, I'm not. Do you want to tell us what the summary for this episode was, then? Sure. The creature returns to London in search of his former family. So Malcolm and Kayetne continue to track Ethan and Hecate, as does Inspector Rusk, with the assistance of Franklin Orsto and his deputies. Dorian and Lily continue their tutelage of Justine in the acquisition of power. As Vanessa continually struggles with the mysterious forces tracking her every move, the beleaguered witch meets a creature of the night who divulges details and clues to her past and says that she has met his master before. Hinting it was in the Banning Clinic, where she spent five months previously. Ooh, you see, season three wrapping all the way back around to season one. Yes, exactly. Wasn't a very good decision by uh, someone to tell Vanessa uh, that there's this connection. No, not at all. Whilst I absolutely approve of his choice of telling her in the, the mirrored a uh, fairground attraction, oh, yes. which is always great for a horror. Going off script, shall we say, against the wishes of the master mm -hmm. doesn't end well for this poor familiar, no. um, unfortunately. So no, I suspect the boy familiar that we've already seen will now take his place. Oh, possibly, yes. Yes, yes. because he is thrust aside quite violently and then fed upon by all the familiars Everybody. in the warehouse. Yeah. Either that or Renfield's going to take his place. One or the other, Maybe. I guess. Um, yeah. But I think if Renfield showed up at the uh, doctor's surgery looking like that, I think Vanessa would be very much on the ball to realise something wasn't quite right with Renfield. <laughs> very true, very true. Um, but I loved... Um, I love the decision to have it in the House of Mirrors uh, at the fairground. Um, it's, it is one of those classic um, scenes for anything to do with horror where you just have your own reflection coming back at you and then you see someone that you either shouldn't see, don't want to see, mm -hmm. um, and then you don't know which is the real version of it oh, um, cool. because of the mirrors. It is just pure classic and i thought that was a great little moment from this episode and a vampire being able to be seen in a mirror which they're not supposed to be able to be done well that's it but he's not a vampire he's a familiar, he's a familiar exactly so uh so a nice little touch there that's uh, able to do that yeah well that was one of the things i was trying to see with dr sweet mm. as well was did his reflection show up in the mirror and i think it did yeah but i i think, I, I think 
that's fine. It would be very hard to work in the National uh, Museum surrounded by glass if he didn't reflect in that glass. Somebody would notice pretty quick, wouldn't they? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and also my um, little joke on Dr. Sweet for this is obviously he takes uh, retribution on the familiar for um, going up to Vanessa and spooking her effectively mm-hmm. um, because on the basis of that, she effectively goes cold uh, towards Dr. Sweet. So dare I say it, um, that he's a little Dr. Bittersweet uh, at this, um, at the moment. <laughs> Never prepare the joke or underline that it's going to be a joke. I know. <laughs> but what else can I do? If I just said Bittersweet, it would sound like the musings of someone who should be in Bedlam mm-hmm. uh, with Dr. Jekyll uh, injecting me with his various chemicals. <laughs> but I, I needed to set it up, even okay. though... It was a terrible joke. <laughs> it was okay. It was okay. Uh, let's get on to our big moments from the episode. What's your big moment from episode three of season three, John? I've kind of hinted at this before. It's the creature um, remembering his his past. Yes. And not only that, um, but beginning to follow up on, on his history, on his past. Um, and I, I really like seeing the unfolding of uh, the backstory uh, like this. You know, we've seen it in snippets of the earlier episodes where, you know, um, he sees his son ill in bed and that gets him to uh, effectively snap the neck of the kid on board the, the ship that's um, uh, locked in ice. That's right. we, we see him coming to this apartment in Chinatown. It, it, it's, it's actually quite a nice moment because he sees Vanessa and, and Dr. Alexander Sweet and he smiles because he recognizes Vanessa. And even though he's about to go over to her to say hello, and then Alexander Sweet comes in, mm-hmm. and you're kind of thinking, will he take this as a form of rejection? And he doesn't. He's happy that she's happy. Exactly. Because that's what he is looking for. Um, and it, that that's a really nice moment. But in this moment, I think it's in, in Chinatown, He's suddenly drawn to this room above um, a Chinese uh, restaurant um, in Chinatown. Uh, and he goes and inquires about the room to see who it is that used to live there. Mm-hmm. Are there any records? And he, he's not getting any form of uh, help from from the guy. He's kind of fairly trying to fob him off, really. He's like, you either take it for what? 10 shillings mm-hmm. um, a month or get out. Um, and this is because, you know, we've seen his memory coming back to him where he, he sees his his wife and his son in this apartment with him during happier days. And I, I like then that this uh, contrasts where um, as, as he's trying to track down where they've gone, the people who used to live here, he tracks his wife and son down to the workhouse mm-hmm. they are destitute um and his, his son seems like he's got consumption as well but the, the, there's a great moment where he's looking through the rafters he's gone up into the loft of the workhouse and he, he he's spying on them it, you know it, it calls back to him spying on um the actress in season one mm-hmm. but you, you know that this is different uh, there's a moment where you see like the old wooden ship on the the window ledge um in the room um and you'd seen it previously in um their flat above the the Chinese restaurant That's in right. Chinatown and all these memories uh flooding back to the creature mm. and he decides to support them by robbing the rich you know so he's becoming Robin Hood almost he's, he's yeah. robbing the rich or at least at this one time to give to his his family to at support least he's not them snapping the necks of the rich to give to the poor well that's true yeah um and i just think this is really nice you know that they find this money and he's looking at them from the rafters again uh, from the loft uh, and you you see the warmth filling him at, in, in terms of this good deed i suppose for me the thing is, will this simply end in another rejection for the creature? You know, the ones that he loves, he's, he's had rejection from Victor at birth. Uh, Lily didn't want uh, to, to, to be with him at yeah. all. Uh, neither did 
the actress led him to being um, kicked out of the theatre by mm-hmm. Vincent, the daughter of Mr. Portney, Lavinia, uh, at the Waxworks. You know, he thought she was kind and ended up really just fulfilling her dad's evil plan to mm-hmm. effectively put him behind bars and make him part of his gruesome act. So he's always found his kindness uh, or the love that he wants to give is a curse, with the exception probably of Vanessa. Um, and I'm just there going... Will this end in that being further solidified in his mind that his his former wife rejects him because of how he looks or his son or the fact that maybe because of his death, that's why they find themselves in the workhouse? Yeah. Or is the rejection one from the fact that they're both dying in some ways, at least with his son? I, th- I think this could be really, really interesting. Mm. You know, th- this is almost like a seminal moment of the creature's um, continued evolution of his, um, his feelings and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I'm kind of a little concerned for him that it's just going to be another rejection, rejection. from the ones that he loves or, or gives love and kindness so easily in, in this sense. Yeah. So, um, I thought this was really good. On the flip side of that though, uh, I love the fact that Vanessa is also remembering her past through mm-hmm. um, the 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 new method of hypnotism that Doctor Seward has suggested that um, she uses, so that they can see um, into the past. And this is certainly coming from the warning from the familiar, who says that you have met the master before mm-hmm. in the 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 great white room, and uh, you get this great. Um, hypnotism where Vanessa begins to remember and the great white room being the padded cell of the Banning yes, Clinic. Uh, really, yeah. really great. Yeah. Um, but what do we find here? We find an orderly bringing her, her evening meal and it is the creature. It yeah. is John Clare. Now, would she have, do you think she's recognized John Clare? I'm wondering. Uh, as the orderly because he, he does look massively different from what we've seen in John Clare. He looks much more like the original actor, obviously, without any prosthesis. Uh, So he looks completely different, I think. So would Vanessa have recognized him when John Clare gets his uh, memories back? Will he recognize Vanessa uh, from that past as opposed to from the the many conversations that they've had in in season two? It's an interesting Um, one, isn't it? Because I can't think that the creature is the master in in this situation. But I, I like the fact that their path have crossed beforehand mm-hmm. given uh, the intimacy underneath the colorific arches yes. um, of london yeah. uh, which w- was really really nicely done yeah absolutely uh, and unfortunately you've just said a second ago that the only person that never shunned him was vanessa and now potentially <laughs> she has a reason to shun john claire no exactly <laughs> yeah so he may unfortunately be left all alone uh, after this revelation as well. But it was great to see Dr. Seward using this technique, I suppose, this technique of hypnotism on Vanessa to bring her back to this to this state and bring her back to the Banning Institute because um, it was a formative moment in her life, you know, and, and hearing her tell these stories to, uh, to Dr. Seward, um, who is treating her like a patient that she will try and cure and will try and help. So, uh, so hopefully this, uh, this hypnotism will help her out, but um, an intriguing one. Uh, if she does connect it with the creature, if she does connect this person that was feeding her while she was there, will she accuse the creature of being the master now? So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, there's a lot of intrigue here, and mm. I like that there are these consequences coming from the creature discovering his own path. That Vanessa's doing the same thing, and that at least unbeknownst to him at the moment, mm. he doesn't know that they're paths have previously collided exactly. even in that small way yeah exactly yeah. exactly uh, weirdly my big moment from the episode i've already talked about uh i talked about it previously about the uh, uneasy alliance between hecate and ethan uh, so i'm actually going to talk more about um lily's plan in this episode i suppose because it is revealed in this episode about yeah. what's actually going on a uh, great scene back at that wonderful table in the centre of london uh, which we know is in dublin castle um but that that the table where uh Herself and Justine are sitting down looking at the protests that are happening from the suffragettes. And you know that Justine has slightly been uh, brought into this plan, this idea of the women of London rising up against their oppressors. And you see Justine kind of going, why don't you just join up with them? Or Lily 
res- responding to an unbidden question, I suppose, from Justine going, well, I'm not going to join up with suffrage- suffragettes. We may have the same enemy, but their placards won't work. Uh, I love that, that idea that she says the only way of getting power is by going out and taking it and doing it silently and doing it behind the backs of everybody. That's the only way you're going to do it. If you stand out and go with placards, you're going to make yourself a target, which is the one thing that Lily doesn't want to be. She wants to make sure that she stands on the ruins of the men of, of men of London. So uh, I really like that, that whole conversation between the two of them as they're bringing Justine into their, their group more. Um, we have the massive scene between the three of them. We have, uh, Lily and Dorian and Justine, uh, having sex in the blood of one of her victims. Like they have Justine yeah. kill, uh, kill a man in their apartment and then they have sex in the blood. And it's, it's almost a ritualistic thing where they induct her into this gang by making her kill this person and then they all have sex together in this moment. You know, it's a, it's a really startling kind of image. In, in it some is. Way. It's hugely startling. It's like, um, you know, Doreen talks about, um, that Justin must prove her worth. That, as you say, it's like this induction. Uh, Dorian talks about the Navient nuns offering their their breasts, uh, cutting them off. Mm. You know, again to reduce temptation. Or the Roman uh, legionnaire uh, bathed in blood. You know, to kill the killing of their enemies. Um, and uh, yeah, the killing of her former slave master that we saw at the start of episode two. Like it's really, really brutal, yeah. um, because you you don't see the stab wounds, but she's she's going pretty crazy, stabbing him mm-hmm. sort of just at the top of the chest or around the shoulder, and then the camera pans back and you see these. It's really good, like makeup the way they've done it. You see the the puncture wounds from her knife as she unleashes her rage against her former uh, captor, and mm-hmm. then you have this kind of blood orgy between. Justine, Dorian, and, and Lily. Yeah. Uh, I, f- I found it very, very Carrie esque, actually, mm. uh, them draped in this blood. Um, I thought it was, it was really shocking yeah. and very startling image. Um, all for this, this induction, uh, into building this army of, um, all the unseen women who pass through this great city of London. Exactly. You know, and it, it connects back to their conversation between Lily and Justine. You know, how do you accomplish anything in this life? By craft, by stealth, by poison, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and as you say, so the suffragettes really are not the example that Lily wants here yeah. at all. This is building an army an army of warriors, but followers. This yeah. is, this is almost cultesque, um, in, in a sense. Yes. And it's even down to Lily's, my favorite quote from the episode, actually from Lily, just the liberty is a bitch that must be bedded on a pile of corpses. Uh, it's the real essence of who the Lily character is here in the show, in this, in this third season. So, uh, really enjoyed that scene, but, uh, but that's my big moment from the episode, my second big moment, because the other one I'd already talked about before. <laughs> well, it, it really is a big moment, the Lily Dorian thing. This is when you realize how far it's gone for these two, uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. What a very startling and intriguing route this has gone. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I would be slightly worried maybe if I was Dorian. Uh, without a doubt. Yes. Um, I don't think that she's making any intentions that he's a leader alongside her, uh, by any means. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> I think he's, he's maybe providing his house and money. Uh, in some, in some <laughs> yeah, senses. exactly. Any notes from the episode that we haven't discussed? I'm sure there's loads actually. Um, yeah, for me, just the title Good and Evil Braided Bee is this conversation between Victor uh, and, uh, and Henry, uh, about whether, again, it comes to this duality, whether you can, um, be both, which is what Victor feels is that you can have both aspects of light and dark within you. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Henry Jekyll says, no, we are one or the other. We must play our role. Mm. Um, so, you know, it, it's really interesting. I, I think it's also a reference to, um, Jekyll and, and Victor, uh, combining yours and my work. They describe that this is good and evil braided be that mm-hmm. the works of the two of them will be meshed together, but they certainly have 
different views on uh, whether that can actually work or whether um, they are both or one or the other. So I, I, I really like this. I, I, I find it a fascinating kind of uh, concept yeah. of, of this idea of being good and evil or good or evil. Yeah. Um, I wonder really which uh, which one of them will think of their work as good and which one thinks of their work as evil. Well, that's yeah. true. That's true as well. Yeah. Uh, just a nice touch of the episode. Obviously, we, we talked about it before, the curing of Mr. Balfour, and now we have the interrogation from Victor to find out whether he is truly cured or whether there's been something uh, done by uh, Dr. Jekyll. Um, yeah, how quickly did you think that was going to drop and how quickly did you think uh, Victor was going to have his, his nose bitten off by, by this guy? Because <laughs> yeah. it goes fast when he changes back. It, the the cure that Dr. Jekyll has created only lasts for a few hours is what you find out here. Um, but, but I like that Jekyll's kind of saying to him, just step back a bit, Victor. Yeah. You know, you are pretty close to this guy. Uh, and then there's the snap and it's instant. It's yeah. just as instant as the transformation to uh, the good version of Mr. Balfour, uh, the transformation back. So um, nice, nice little horror moment. Yeah, also. definitely. Jump, jump scare. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, just coming on the Hecate, I, I like the fact she puts on the fatal English charm as she takes out the farmer and the farmer's wife mm-hmm. as they steal the horses. And I like that as well, back in Cascabel, in the saloon where you've had the um, unleashing of Ethan's uh, wolf uh, on on the, uh, the saloon, the Inspector Rusk can identify that there were two people involved here. You see the animalistic ripping from yeah, Ethan, mm-hmm. yet uh, a couple of the people killed in um, the saloon were done by Hecate in a much cleaner, less, uh, you know, more precise manner, I suppose. Yes. Yes. And he even, I think he even says to this new lawman that's working with him that he needs to believe in the occult. So, a slight change from Rusk in season two, or I suppose development of Rusk in season two. We talked about the fact that he's willing to follow any lead, no matter where it takes him. Now we're saying, now we're showing that he knows where it leads him. It leads to the occult. It leads to things yes. like werewolves because he's aware of them now. So, uh, so willing to, t- to now tell other law people, guys, you know, don't discount anything. You don't know yeah, what's, what absolutely. could be out there, you know. Um, that's it for my notes for the episode. Anything else from you, John? No, that's all from me as well. Yeah. Overall, what did you think of the start of start of season three of Penny Dreadful? To be honest, I've I've really enjoyed connecting in with this. I think it's a little more fragmented. To be honest, mm-hmm. it, it's you, you get snippets uh, of, of of different parts of this world in, in quite small chunks. But after a couple of episodes, they're, they're forming a bigger picture. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's normally how these things work. And maybe it's just because it's two of us, but it fa- felt really difficult to pick out big moments because mm-hmm. actually it's a lot of uh, small moments accumulated together. And I think that's why I've been trying to pick things from episode two when I discussed Dr. Jekyll's arrival uh, for my main point for episode one. Mm. Um, Otherwise, you'd miss out on some of these things. I think the touch with each character is um, much lighter than in the past Mm. uh, seasons. I think it might be that we, in in episode one, have seen the first and last time we see Mr. Lyle within Penny Dreadful. I hope not, but I, I have a feeling... Um, he will be much more peripheral now in in season three, which mm. is a shame. Um, but I'm really enjoying it. I'm I'm loving the new partnerships and how they're having to um cope with or or develop outside of that. I suppose the relative um companionship of the previous company. I was going to say safety, but I don't think anyone's ever really no safe no. uh, in in this show. I mean, very intrigued by this dark, twisted route for for Lily and Dorian. I'm loving the fact that you've got Doctor Jekyll in there. I really mm-hmm. want to see how that develops, and I like how he's been paired up with um with with Victor Frankenstein mm-hmm. and of course having uh, Remfield and Dr Seward you know the these stalwarts of the Dracula tale uh, reshaped and and repurposed here by John Logan is, is just really uh, nicely done yeah. uh, and in particular that Dr Seward um is a relative of Joan Clayton mm-hmm. uh, the cut wife of Ballantrae Moore what a great great idea I think at the moment I would give this four bittersweets out of five. I think it's still absolutely high quality, um, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think it just takes a little bit more time to to get used to a, a slightly different pitter patter of how the episodes go. Um, but certainly uh, as well, uh, I love Wes Stuzy here um, as Kayetney. Yeah, you know, uh, and him pairing up with Sir Malcolm, and I, I think that's it. You want to spend a bit more time. You want, I think, maybe you, we've been used to John Logan lingering with the characters mm-hmm. and really getting that luxury with them and here because of geography and, and so on you you're moving around a lot more yeah I've heard um, that, yeah. you know and uh certainly with such a large ensemble now uh that means your time with them is a little more fleeting than, mm-hmm. than in the past or it's it's the the time is is accumulated over the episodes and yeah. so um i think that's why i've been as i say been just trying to sort of accumulates it together in a point on one of the episodes yeah yeah so yeah i would give this four bittersweets out of five oh, that's dr bittersweet dr you, alexander so. bittersweets <laughs> um I, I really enjoyed the start of season three but i i do feel this impending sense of when does it get bad because this still feels like the same show as season two it, it feels exactly the same to me and it feels like it's the same characters uh, we know a lot more about the characters so everything has a bit more weight to us everything that, we, that we're seeing in this season it feels like you already know everything about the characters so when something's happening you're going oh i remember when that happened to the character which you didn't have as much of yeah when you started the show because you didn't know much about them so now we're into season three we're introducing new character introducing dracula you know of all of all people um so we he also comes with his own weight as well you know dr jekyll comes with his own weight and own yeah. backstory so you're right i do want to spend time with all of these characters but they all come with a lot of knowledge in my head as to who they are so uh, i'm expecting things to happen as the show goes on whether that happens or not i don't know but it's a good start to the third season of the show as to where we are right now definitely and um, I, I think one of the things as well is you know christian uh, camargo who plays dr alexander sweet i think uh, his portrayal is really, really good. It really pulls on that charmingness of Dracula that he can, that almost mesmerism of what vampires do. Mm-hmm. It, it's almost like he's mesmerizing Vanessa with his charm yeah. in, in pure daylight. Oh, absolutely. Um, There's even that scene where he has the, uh, the local women of the community coming in to watch yeah, one, of his, exactly. one of his lectures. And you can tell all of them are just there because he's Dr. Sweet, we've got to go and see his lectures, even though and they have no interest in what he's talking exactly. about. Exactly. <laughs> it, 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 you know, the, there's a real, the, there's a suave sexiness there that he's pulling on and um, that is really good for for Dracula, mm-hmm. um, I think. It, it really connects in with that sophisticated charmer and mesmerizer that Dracula can be, yeah. you know, and uh, not like just the grotesque. So I, I think that's uh, a, a nice thing. And I think it links very much back to uh, what John Clare says, you know, that the devil comes beautiful. It's mm-hmm. a siren. Uh, so, it, you know, it connects in with that quite nicely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us for our discussions for part six of Penny Dreadful about season three, episodes one to three. If you want to get in contact with us, you can email us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or you can pop over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash TV podcast industries. You can also sp- subscribe to the Dreadful Podcast at dreadfulpodcast.com. Uh, leave us a review if you listen to us on any podcast catcher that has the ability to leave reviews. Uh, you can also subscribe to the main podcast at tvpodcastindustries.com. We've covered lots and lots of stuff. We're almost at 500 episodes of TV show coverage. Uh, so loads and loads of stuff there for you to listen to on the various shows Definitely. you might be interested in. We'll be back next time with our discussions about Penny Dreadful Season 3, Episodes 4 to 6. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you next time. Yes, thank you so much, fellow Darklings, for joining us. As always, it's a pleasure speaking with you. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and importantly, keep screaming. Bye. Bye. Bye.